Italian department. Thank you all for coming to this event, for braving the cold weather, and for coming here today. Um, I am here to welcome you today, but also with the acknowledgement that the buildings of the University of Minnesota and this space itself is on Dakota homeland, and so we are also guests in this space, which is not our own. Um, so the CDSC was founded in 2015 through the labor and vision of R. Nizera, Jenna Desai, and Angela Carter, with the help of Riggs and GWIS at the University of Minnesota. And our aim is cultivating community engagement and intellectual inquiry around the study of disability at the University of Minnesota. As a collective, we approach disability not only as an identity category, but as an ever-shifting sociocultural and political formation. This means we think about disability as a, a vector of oppression that intersects in profound ways with other socially constructed categories such as race, class, gender, sexuality, and citizenship. In other words, we look at disability and culture not as a medical issue, but also as a social justice issue that we interrogate with tools, tools of cultural criticism among others. And this year we decided to focus our programming and readings around the theme of disability justice. And we decided on this focus for two reasons. First, we realized that limiting the conversation to disability rights alone, while crucial and important, risks rendering disability as an anomalous individual misfortune that requires a supplement of accommodations to fix it rather than addressing disability as a pervasive social-cultural construction with attendant and intersecting oppressions. Fighting for disability justice means fighting for a redefinition of what individual worth means, and fighting for no less than a paradigm shift in the ableist and capitalist criteria by which the world judges and prioritizes active and productive members of society. Secondly, as a field, disability justice calls on us to rethink our participation collectively and intersectionally. Such collaboration with a deep attention to race, gender, and queerness is also an occasion for joy, for a renewed revaluing of other networks and care and from learning from each other. Disability justice can invite us to reimagine or to speculatively dream of a future different. In, uh, in this light, many of our programming this year so, so far from the Disability Justice and Community, community Activism event in October to a panel on Disability Justice and Campus Activism in, in November highlights the exciting work happening within critical disability studies and disability activism, both from elected council people to dedicated student groups. We push forward in thinking through strategies of resistance to the oppressive and reductive conventions surrounding non-privileged bodies, convention, conventions that many in our society view as normal. As we continue to strive for disability justice, we turn to activists, writers, and thinkers, such as our esteemed speaker today, Maria X. B. Brown, for models of how to accomplish this work. Before I introduce Lydia, I would also like to briefly mention that disability justice organizer and writer, Leah Lakshmi Piesna Samarasinha, author of Care Work, Dreaming Disability Justice, will be giving a talk and a workshop on Wednesday, February 27th, and we will be sending out more details via our listserv, so please be sure to include your information on the sign-in sheet outside. The CDSC would like to give our deep thanks to Riggs for welcoming us, hosting, housing us, and giving our home. Our particular gratitude to Riggs Director Karen Ho and Program Administrator Sarah Bunquist, logistics worker extraordinaire, for all your help in planning and supporting our endeavors. DRC, the Disability Resource Center, for its continued service to our community and support of our events, big and small. With particular thanks to Jane Wilson, whose dedication to insight and endless wealth of policy and accessibility knowledge has made this organization uh, and our events extraordinary. To the GWIS Department, which is Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies, for co-sponsoring this event, for helping with logistical support, and also for foregrounding disability studies on this campus. Um, and to the Imagine Special Event Grant and co-sponsors, the Institute for Advanced Studies, Multicultural Affairs, the Department of Political Science, the School of Social Work, the Bakken Center, the Disability Resource Center, the Department of History, the 
Women's Center and the Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities. Thank you to the people at Rathwell, this is uh, this building here, for helping us create an accessible and welcoming environment, and to the French Bakery for providing us with snacks. And um, to everyone on the CDSB leadership team who have worked countless hours to make, this, uh, to make this event everything we have imagined. Special thanks to events coordinator Jessica Williams, who has led this team with great, enviable logistical planning skills and steadfast determination. And to Angela Carter, our inspiration and our visionary, both of whose labor has been invaluable in making sure that the CDSB exists and thrives. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Lydia X. B. Brown, who is a disability justice advocate, organizer, and writer, whose work has largely focused on violence against multiply marginalized disabled people, especially institutionalization, incarceration, and policing. They have worked to advance transformative change through organizing the streets, writing legislation, conducting anti-ableism workshops, testifying at regulatory and policy hearings, and disrupting institutional complacency everywhere, from the academy to state agencies and the nonprofit industrial complex. Lydia's leadership and activism accomplishments are almost too numerous to list here. Currently, Lydia is a Justice Catalyst Fellow at the Babylon Center for Mental Health Law, working on defending and advancing the educational civil rights of Maryland youth in psychosocial, intellectual, and developmental disabilities, facing forms of dis dis part, uh, sorry, disproportionate discipline, restraint, and seclusion. In collaboration with E. Eskenazi and Morne Kizua Onairu, they are co-editor and visionary behind the first ever anthology of writings and artwork by authentic people of color, entitled All the Weight of Our Dreams. And one aspect that I particularly admire about Lydia's work is that they strive for intersectional racial and disability justice, not only at the state and governmental level, while serving as the former chairperson of Massachusetts Developmental Disability Council, but they also fight ableism in the intimate spaces of the, of the classroom as a university teacher and a former student advocate. We are honored to have Lydia here today with us as we speak on the topic, topic of youthless peers, public charges, hulking monsters, disability and surviving state violence. I am extremely amused that your gender identity studies department is called g <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's, that's one of the best things I've heard all day. This might make a noise. Particularly weird uh, when I can see the wood, but not you. <laughs> so thank you, Jenny, for that introduction. Um, Jenny already offered to you to make use of this space in the ways that each of us needs to be comfortable. But I like to reiterate that when I begin any kind of a presentation or a workshop, the image on this slide shows silhouettes of people of various body shapes and sizes, leaning or lying or moving in a number of ways that are not often considered acceptable in quote-unquote academic or professional spaces, including someone who I would really like to be right now who is just lying flat on the floor. <laughs> I have done that at conferences, for the record. Um, at another conference, I delivered my talk while sitting cross-legged on top of the podium. He did not fall over, so I did not sue the hotel. It was all great. But the moderator at that panel was giving me the look of Oh God, what have I gotten myself into? I was like, this is what happens when you invite me. I sit on top of the podium because I feel like it. But this one, I'm, I'm not sure if it's quite that sturdy or comfortable. So I, I will forego my podium sitting adventures. This slide says, please use this space as you need or prefer. Sit in chairs or on the floor, pace, lie on the floor, rock, clap, spin, move around, come in and out of the room. I want to take this moment to offer an invitation and an invocation to each of us present. I'd like to begin workshops and presentations this way to bring us all together in this, in this space that we share for the next hour or so that we have it. And that invitation is for each of us to take a moment to ground ourselves in where our body minds are at. To listen to what our body minds are telling us. To tune in to what our body minds are telling us that they want, that they need, that they desire what they are struggling with, what they have, whether that is that we are still hungry or thirsty, there's 
food in the back and that would help. That we're tired, which I know is the case for me. That we are cold or perhaps not so cold anymore because it's above zero. Mm-hmm. So I guess that, you know, it's better. Mm-hmm. I sent a panicked email two days ago to someone here saying, wait, how cold is it actually? <laughs> Uh, and my supervisor said, you're getting on a flight to where? <laughs> <laughs> but to listen to all these things our bodies are telling us about how they exist in the environment, inside this building, outside, we came into this building, and to take a moment to ask ourselves what we need. Sometimes people like to close their eyes to do this, but you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Mm. Thank you. I'd like to begin presentation with this kind of an invocate, in invitation and invocation for us to tune into our own body minds because for me at the core of the practice of disability justice is being able to honor, affirm, and make active space for our own selves to exist. Especially for many of us who are present today, who inhabit bodies at the margins of the margins, who are often placed somewhere where our ability to access that space itself is precarious. It's not guaranteed, it's not confirmed, it's conditional. It can be taken away at any time. That we are not allowed to take up the space. That we are not allowed or given an opportunity to give ourselves permission to fully inhabit our own bodies and minds. Because, as we know, being on a university campus right now, the mythos of inclusion and diversity looms large. That we may be included or diversified as a way to slightly exotify the status quo of the dominant structures and hierarchies embedded into the university and its increasingly corporatized space, but we may only do so so long as we do not fundamentally threaten or destabilize it. So long as we're not seeking to completely dismantle and replace the structures within it that enact violence against us. And so we are not given permission to feel what we feel. We are not given permission to be who we are, except only in commodified, reduced, simplified versions of ourselves that might as well not exist. Versions of ourselves where we continue to die each day. I like to give this note because when I enter into a space, there's two reactions that happen. One reaction is that I give this note and I make this invitation, and most of the room stiffens. They become tense. Their shoulders tighten, their jaws tighten. They self-consciously glance out of the corners of their eyes. They direct their attention very specifically at the front of the room. And there's this immediate feeling that it's almost, it's palpable, this tension that is running through their bodies, that the people who are in the room are thinking, okay, I heard this invitation, but is this also a lie? What happens if I accept the invitation? What happens if I actually seize the space that my body mind is demanding that I take? And perhaps one or two, maybe three people in this space will a little bit cautiously, ever so cautiously, try to take me up on that invitation while most of the room stiffens, afraid. Because 99% of the time, when somebody says, oh, you should be who you are, you are all welcome, what they actually mean is, I want to use you, exploit you, and ruin you. The other half of the time, when I make this invitation, I enter into a space, there's a palpable sense of relief. Shoulders loosen. Bodies take up the space that they were formerly compressed into, even within the smaller seats. They were compressed. They were tightened. People take in that they are giving themselves permission to move from the chairs and the configuration of the room set to force some kind of invisible order or discipline that we don't have to adhere to it. And the whole dynamic of the room changes with very few people whose bodies do not make at least some subtle shift from the way that they held themselves when coming into the room. There are two reactions to this invitation. There is very little space in between. 
the second note that I want to give as we continue our foray into today's discussion is that, as you may guess from the title and description of the talk that's been circulating, but if you didn't know, I will be talking quite a bit about various types of violence and harm inflicted on disabled people. Um, I'm not planning to be deliberately graphic or gratuitous in descriptions of violence. I don't feel a need to shock an audience. Some people do. I have done that in the past. I think there's a time and a place for that strategy. But I want you all to know that we will be talking about some heavy topics. And if at any time you need a break from this space, feel free to come in or out of this room to de disengage, to decompress, or if you feel that you are no longer able to engage or participate at all, to withdraw your participation. And you don't need my permission to do that, but I want you to know that if you are leaving, 99% um, of my brain will know that you don't hate me <laughs> and you're not trying to think of every reason why I'm a terrible presenter and you wish that Minnesota never invited me here. The other 1% of my brain, which has social anxiety, will be telling me every person in this room personally wants you to die today of everything horrible at the same time. Frostbite and being hit by an 18-wheeler and every form of cancer simultaneously. All at once. Because I hate you. And the other 99% of my brain will say, no, Lydia, that is not grounded in reality. I understand your fear, it is valid, but it is not grounded in reality. And that 1% of my brain will continue. So if you need to take a break, please do so, and ignore that 1% of my brain. The, the rest of us will handle it. Probably. I should not guarantee things that I may not be able to follow through on, but we'll try. I want to start our discussion today by talking about what it means to live as a disabled person at the apex of state violence targeting us through multiple generations. You see, we have a number of mythologies that circulate in our minds, in our communities, in our academies, that violence either exists only as an abstract, sure, it happens, but we're all here, so what do we know about violence? Well, what do you know about violence, Lydia? You're a person standing in front of a room who flew from another state. You probably experience every single privilege under the sun, and therefore you don't know what it means to be targeted by anything at all which is not actually accurate, but we'll get to that. The other mythology that we often hold is that this violence is a thing of the past. It does not happen much anymore. If it does, we can hyper-individualize it and say it was the result of a single person's animus. They committed a hate crime against the disabled person, or at worst, they were neglectful and ignorant. But there is not any kind of widespread violence that happens now because now we live in a humane, civilized society, a word that is intensely colonizing, intensely white supremacist, as it may be, but this idea that our society is somehow civilized, it is somehow uh, one that we care about due process under law, whatever this law is supposed to mean, and so this violence is something of the past. It happened. It was horrible, but we've moved on. Willowbrook is closed. The Nazis were defeated in 1945, according to white people. And because of that, we no longer have to worry about what state violence looks like or means for those of us who are disabled. But the reality is that violence never disappeared nor did it somehow transfer from the public sphere only to the private sphere. The language and science of eugenics, of portioning a population based upon the worthy members of its population and the unworthy members of its population, never disappear and continue to haunt us from the heyday of eugenics in the 1920s and the 1930s to now. The word has only fallen out of favor because we associate it with the Third Reich. And if we didn't do that, we would probably still use the term. We would probably still have our societies for social hygiene. There are lingering effects of this nomenclature in New York State. There is still a department of behavioral hygiene. 
a term that makes me feel like I'm snowing up a little bit of my mouth every time I say it. So well, the fact that we have coffee is great. This bitter taste can go great with my bitterness and feelings about our country and its imposition on stolen land. The image you are looking at here is a diagram that was very popular in the 1920s and continued to be used into the 1930s. It's an image that shows a set of stairs with humans who are placed at each level of the stairs um, deliberately depicted as though to appear expressionless, unable to move their bodies in ways that would project power or strength or capability, and they are labeled from the bottom to the top as idiot, low-grade imbecile, medium imbecile, high-grade imbecile, and moron. The diagram is labeled Steps of Mental Development, a caption where they stumble, the limit of development of each type, reprinted from the survey of October 11, uh, of October 2000, of 1911 to 1913. This is why I don't function at any hour prior to dinner time. <laughs> October 1911 to 1913. Not this, not this century. The previous century. The diagram mentions that for each of these levels of quote unquote development, which were terms used for what we call intellectual disability today, or that the idiot is capable of self preservation only, the low grade imbecile is capable of simple menial work, the medium imbecile is capable of simple manual work, the high grade imbecile capable of complex manual work, and the moron capable of work requiring reason and judgment. Are there folks in this room who've seen this diagram before by a show of hands? And are there folks for whom this is something you have not yet witnessed by a show of hands? That's most people, okay. So like three people have seen this and however many other people are here have not. I don't count, I don't do numbers, because I'm a lawyer, we don't do math. <laughs> if you leave me in charge of the math, we get audited and fined. <laughs> not a good plan. If you leave me in charge of the math, we all leave the restaurant, we hope we'd all pay about $10 for our meal, and someone ended up paying 44 <laughs> And then they hate me. So, um, this diagram was used as a way to classify people with intellectual disabilities based on, very specifically, the type of work they were considered capable of doing, and what kind of value that work was deemed to offer to society. These exact terms as medical or clinical terminology are not generally used in clinical literature. Now they've just become everyday insults. Let's use slurs against people with intellectual disabilities as a way to insult anybody that we don't like, or our abusive ex, or our horrible boss, or the person who drunk drove. Let's just use disability slurs to accomplish this, this meaning. I think I hear a dog as I probably heard a dog as Dogs and cats are the equivalent of, oh look, a squirrel for me. <laughs> Which is great. See, we're going to have a very entertaining ride this lunchtime. <laughs> we're going to talk about eugenics and dogs. Uh, which are, uh, fortunately, dogs do not participate in eugenic science, which is great for all of us. <laughs> dogs are infinitely better than humans. If we could transform humans into dogs, things would be a lot better and we would not have these horrible dehumanizing diagrams like this one. Mm -hmm. This was printed in a scientific journal, just for reference. It was printed in a scientific journal. The idea that people should be contributors to society continues to inflect our modern day thinking, but it came out of scientists working in the Western world, particularly here out of the United States, who are at the forefront of trying to create improvement of the race. Their entire diagram that depicts how and when white people in particular were expected or hoped to procreate so that white people could somehow become smarter and stronger and quote unquote more civilized, which I don't really understand given the lack of spice in your cooking, but that's fine. And <laughs> somehow to achieve scientific betterment of humanity by eliminating traits considered undesirable, inferior, or defective. This thinking transported itself across the Atlantic into Nazi Germany. The images you are looking at now are two propaganda posters from the 1930s under the Third Reich. 
The one on the left hand shows a person who is supposed to be depicted as having a cognitive disability or a congenital condition standing alone with a sign that says costing 5.5 right marks. And on the other side of the diagram, there's an image of a, a very light colored looking like Aryan, like white German family of, of, of course, a mother and a father and three young children that are also holding a sign that says 5.5 rank marks. And what the text says from the German in translation is that the, the cost of feeding this person on the left, who is depicted as having a disability, is 5.5 rank marks per day. And that is the same cost that in one day could be used to feed, a, and the word that's used there is healthy, a healthy family the same cost. The person with the disability is also depicted in darker clothing and in, in, in a type of shading that indicates that this is a person that we want to say the light is not shining on. There is a shadow here. And on the right hand side, that the family is depicted in this glowing daylight. Like these are the people who are the example of the pinnacle of humanity. There are other posters that are very similar. I didn't want to include all of the same theme that show um, the, the propaganda saying, you know, this is the cost of feeding a person with this disability for an entire year, 34,000 Reich marks. And, and it says, this comrade is also your money. There's another one that shows a, an image that was taken from the United States of a black disabled person in an institution that was explicitly labeled as this is a black person, they use a different word, that this person's care costs 8,000 of, of nursing care per day. And the Nazi said, this is why we don't need disabled people in society. The one on the right hand side is a photograph of an orphanage where institutionalized children with disabilities are all placed in these wooden cradles and there's two staff standing above them. And the text says, Leben nur als Leib, which is life only as a burden. I can't pronounce German, but I'm here speaks German, sorry. Life only as a burden. The other term that the Nazi regime used to describe disabled people, other than describing us as useless eaters, was as Lebens und Wirtes Lebens, life unworthy of life. Option T4 was the Nazis' euthanasia program in which they piloted the use of mass murder methods that they would then use to kill six million Jewish people along with millions of Roma and Polish people and all manner of other communities targeted as unworthy of existing. They piloted the mass murder methods on disabled people across racial and ethnic groups, whether they were Jewish and also disabled, whether they were German non-Jewish but happened to be disabled. But the, the common characteristic of this pilot group in T4 was that they were all people with different types of disabilities. They were blind, they were deaf, they were people who had mobility impairment, they were people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, they were people labeled mentally ill, and they were killed en masse to rid the Nazi society of the useless eaters who only exist as burden. Because of this, the term eugenics has fallen out of favor. We don't like to talk about it, but in large part this we, meaning people who have scientific, political, and academic power and influence in the United States, are people who don't want to have to associate themselves, their history, their fields, their professions, with widespread mass violence, with mass murder, with the culling of whole human populations on the basis of ideas about which were valuable and worthy and desirable and producing and productive and which were not. The idea today that to be valuable in society, we must somehow frame ourselves rhetorically as contributing members of society has its roots entangled with this racist, ableist, violence of separating out disabled and negatively racialized people's body minds from those considered worthy of reproducing and being reproduced. There's a frequent talk about this idea that we are contributing members of society and a form of inspiration porn or inspo porn that is common across 
many axes of state violence and marginality. We know it very, we're very familiar with it, you know, within disability community, the idea that we're valuable because, well, yes, you have a disability, but don't worry, you also have a degree. Or yes, you have a disability, but don't worry, you also, like, can do something superhuman or extraordinary without, like, dying, like, I guess, walk outside this week. I don't know. But, like, we don't think about this exact same type of rhetoric of inspiration porn as to how we apply it when we're talking about the rhetoric that young white college students with massive white savior complexes talk about low-income black and brown kids in the U.S. and outside of it. It's the same exact kind of narrative. Here's someone who is from outside of your community coming in to rescue or save you or help you because you couldn't do it for yourself. You needed the white, educated, probably wealthy college student to come and do it for you. It's the same type of rhetoric we use when we say, well, you know, the reason why America is a nation of immigrants on stolen land, which, you know, mm -hmm. conveniently, let's forget that. We're a nation of immigrants. Immigrants make America great because why? Because, oh, people might have come from nothing, but don't worry, they work really hard and pull themselves up by their bootstraps. A metaphor that doesn't even make sense because if you try to pull straps on your boots and you pull really hard, you'll probably just fall over backwards and fracture your vertebrae, which really hurts. Which I, I don't know that from personal experience, but I have enough friends who do that I'd rather not. I did not and say I did. You pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You achieve the American dream, which is you assimilate into white aspirations. White wealthy aspirations. You fit neatly into their story because you are no longer this person reliant upon state help so that you became this self-sufficient person like, you know, billionaires are all apparently self-made like this Howard Schultz did. I don't know how that happened when you were actually just profiting off of the exploitation and enslavement of people all around the world, mostly communities of color, but apparently you're self-made. And if you're an immigrant and you do the same thing, suddenly you're worthy of adulation. It's a type of inspiration form. But we also use the same phenomenon, the same type of description as something to aspire to, as something by which to define your worth and whether you deserve basic right or freedom. When we talk about people who are confined in prison, when we say this person should be released, this person should have parole because they've proven that they can be a contributing member of society. Because this person will no longer they will produce, they will contribute, they will become a nice cog in the capitalist, racist, ableist machine, not challenge you, not threaten you, and that's why we should allow this person to be released from prison, maybe, conditionally, and still impose surveillance upon them. But they won't be behind bars anymore, so you should all throw confetti. We use the same type of rhetoric that we talk about disabled folks with, with any person for whom systems of oppression would like us to recast oppression as not being a societal problem, but rather being an individual problem, an individual burden to bear, that if only the person has enough forbearance, that only the person has enough grit and determination and a good attitude, smiles everyone, then they will overcome whatever adversities have been placed in their path using the passive voice very intentionally. Ableism, white supremacy, capitalism don't want us to acknowledge or name that there is no passive construction in this. There's no adversities that have been placed in our past. There is our government working overtime to incarcerate and kill. There is our neighbors joining hate groups and propagating rhetoric that leads to our dehumanization, our institutionalization, our isolation, our prolonged targeting by predators who know that they can act with impunity and without any person breathing a word about what they do to us. There are people involved in making this happen. But in the society we live in, those who wield the power and the resources, those who create the conditions of artificial scarcity, those who enable the, the mechanisms of social control that seek to divide us and to isolate us into communities not working in solidarity with one another, <coughs> they don't want us to know that. And they don't want us to think about it. They certainly don't want us to organize. 
In the past couple of years in the United States, it's been a trend, not exclusively, but primarily by what I like to call white liberals, TM, <laughs> to speak about the current presidential administration as somehow the worst thing since whatever existed before sliced bread. <laughs> that this is now a uniquely dangerous time, more so than at any other time in U.S. history, and that this is a situation in which we are facing dangers and harms that did not exist before. That's not really an accurate description, one that completely erases the experiences of targeted and marginalized communities that are not white and are not wealthy for centuries of literal enslavement and, of, and domination and land occupation and theft and genocide and all sorts of things that largely did not affect white and wealthier people. But, you know, now that white and wealthier people are facing some overt forms of violence, now it's a crisis. Something that has escaped the attention of many of these very same white liberals, TM, <laughs> is the particular types of violence that this administration is now seeking to enact that further and exacerbate existing harm to targeted and marginalized communities that have already faced the brunt of everyday violence. One of those is that of the public charge. How many folks who are in this room are aware of the proposal currently by the Trump administration about public charge and have a sense of what that is? I see like a few maybe hands and like a couple of um, yes hands. And how many folks are in the room like, okay, this is the title of this talk, but I don't know what the fuck that is. <laughs> And that is a lot more hands, okay. And how many people are like, I didn't really have an answer to that question, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, there's a few hands and a very confused look. Great, yeah. So public charge is actually something that, like many things the white liberals TM are talking about in regards to Trump, is not new, but in fact has existed for many years in our immigration and naturalization code. In United States law, there is always been a basis for denying admission to the United States or denying eligibility to receive a visa so that you can be admitted to the United States if you are believed that once you immigrate, you will likely to become, quote, a public charge, which is defined as becoming reliant upon one or more forms of state-funded or subsidized assistance, such as subsidized housing, food stamps, social security payments, uh, or other forms of public assistance, right? And um, that's already existed. That harkens back to the days of eugenics. When immigrants would enter en masse at the Ellis Island point of entry with that famous statue, and where immigrants would be separated and quarantined into separate areas to ensure that they did not bring any communicable diseases with them. A practice that continues to linger, but is less overt and less clinical as it might have been in that exact period of time. The proposal by the Trump administration, which was unveiled in the fall, is to expand public charge, to include revoking admissibility for people who are already in the United States, who already have papers, but who are now using one or more forms of government assistance. The idea behind public charge, as encapsulated in this very particular type of white right-wing bootstrap theory is that people who need state help shouldn't be here because don't we need to quote unquote take care of our own first? Something that sounds quite white to me, but that's a conversation for another time. Reflected in that very same mindset underpinning the new public charge proposal is a bit of history in Supreme Court, now the nominee Brett Kavanaugh, um, history from just a few years ago in Washington, D.C. There was a case, Doe v. D.C., from just this past decade, involving a group of three people with intellectual disabilities receiving state-funded services from the District of Columbia Developmental Disabilities Administration. And of those three, um, who were all forced to undergo what would be considered an elective procedure, but without their consent. Two were people with intellectual disabilities who were forced into abortions that they did not want. 
And Brett Kavanaugh's decision in that case upheld the ability of state government to require people with intellectual disabilities, if it deemed that it should do so, to undergo abortion procedures that they would not have chosen had they been given an option, and to be able to exercise their own autonomy over their own bodies. This is the person who naturally was endorsed by a number of right-wing anti-choice groups for his stance as a pro-life person who would potentially help overturn the Roe v. Wade case. But in the, of the two cases that Kavanaugh had made decisions on involving an abortion, one was one that allowed the state to force abortion on people with intellectual disabilities who did not consent to ending their pregnancy. This decision has itself a long and storied history in the U.S. Back to this heyday of eugenics in 1927, the Supreme Court had a ruling in a case called Buck v. Bell involving a white woman who was said to have intellectual disabilities, but may or may not have, whose mother was also labeled with an intellectual disability, but may not have had one, who gave birth to an infant <coughs> child who was conceived as a result of sexual violence. That this person who was sterilized was said that her rights were not only not violated, but in fact, her sterilization was done for the greater good. This is a test case that was deliberately brought all the way to the United States Supreme Court to pave the way for legal affirmation of and perpetuation of eugenic sterilization and counseling of who should reproduce and what kinds of people we should want to be reproduced. The decision written by the acting Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, said to be allegedly one of the most progressive jurists of the 20th century, a notion which I can now hereby continue throwing up a little bit in the back of my mouth, wrote describing Carrie and this sterilization that three generations of imbeciles are enough. That decision has never been overturned. It was actually cited as important precedent supporting the decision made in Roe v. Wade in 1973. The reason being that in Roe v. Wade, the court found that sometimes the state has an interest in whether people are pregnant or not pregnant. Because of that, Buck v. Bell is enshrined in our legal history. At any time we talk about reproductive health, reproductive rights, or reproductive justice, we are also talking about reproductive violence on the basis of ableism. And more often than not, a racialized white supremacist ableism. Carrie Buck was white, and that was par probably a large part of why she was selected as a candidate for the test case. The last part of the discussion on state violence that I want to raise with us is the idea of the disabled person as a hulking monster. Unlike the language of useless eater or public charge, you won't find the language hulking monster in political literature, and you won't find it in state-sponsored propaganda, and you won't find it in fact sheets issued by policy centers. But where you will hear this phrase used is an everyday testimony and conversation between people, between community members and neighbors, between people who wield power over those who don't. Teachers and paraprofessionals describing developmentally disabled students as threatening, scary, and dangerous. Um, a very large teachers union in the United States has fought for years in opposition to a piece of legislation called the Keeping Students Safe Act, which would outlaw most forms of restraint and seclusion federally. They've opposed this piece of legislation on the basis that restraint and seclusion are necessary last resort interventions to keep teachers safe from dangerous children. You'll also hear this phrase on the lips of certain types of police officers and neighborhood watch patrol, people like George Zimmerman who murdered Trayvon Martin, who described 
specifically often black people, sometimes native or Latinx people, as this type of horrible, monstrous figure that poses such a threat to white people that deadly force is not only permissible, but in fact, practically mandatory in order to protect and preserve the sanctity of whiteness. The idea that people who are somehow weird or strange or freakish are somehow also necessarily dangerous pervades our folklore, our cinema, just the way that we talk to each other, going back forever. Penhurst, which used to be one of the most notorious institutions where thousands upon thousands of disabled people were confined in squalor and subjected to all manner of abuse, is now, every year, a haunted house. It's, it's exhibited at Halloween for tickets as, as an attraction where you can go to experience a haunted asylum for the criminally insane. And after prolonged protests by many of us as disabled folks, what they decided to do to mitigate the horrifying and dangerous type of ableism in that type of exhibition was they created a small exhibit on the Pennhurst site about the history of it as an institution. <laughs> because that completely erases the dehumanizing aspect of putting our traumatizing history out there as something fun and also scary. This pervades our schools and our universities and how people like me who are autistic and mentally ill in some or another way are written off as scary. Potential mass shooters. Someone to watch and surveil. Someone to control. Someone to regulate because someone like you is probably a threat to the social order because someone like you is inherently unstable or defective or inferior. When I was in 10th grade, I was falsely accused of planning a school shooting. Oh. And I was one of the lucky ones because I'm light-skinned, because my parents are white, because I'm able to communicate using my mouth part. I managed somehow to get the cops not called on me. But some of my friends were not so lucky they were criminally charged. They were taken all the way to court, all the way through trial on charges of domestic terrorism related to accusations that because everyone saw them as the weird, scary freak, that they were probably the next threat to the tranquility and social order of the school. We now at most universities have what is called a threat assessment team. I haven't looked but I wouldn't be surprised if there's one here at the University of Minnesota. I'm getting a couple of nods, so I, I think that is correct. It exists. There's one at my alma mater. How the third assessment team works is that if you are concerned about another student, the definition of what ought to be concerning is left nebulous and ambiguous such that we can insert our own racist and ableist projections onto it. You can report this to the school and if they think that sounds scary, they will refer the student's matter to the threat assessment team, which will include someone with a psychology background and probably include somebody from the dean or provost's office who will decide whether they think this is a student that should be monitored. And if they are, that student may then be required to submit to weekly or monthly check-ins. That student may have their room or their sessions searched. That student may be required to attend mandatory counseling sessions of a type of therapy they did not intend to seek out with a therapist they did not choose and with notes from that session shared with the administration. So they can continue to evaluate whether they think that that student is a threat or not. The idea of disabled people, particularly those of us at the margins of margins within disability, as somehow these horrible, dangerous threats to the peace of abled people to not have to worry about us existing. The abled, white, wealthy people who would like to go about their lives not remembering that we exist to disrupt their notions of their own comfort and safety, that somehow we threaten that merely by existing and, and then in their imaginations become these violent creatures that are, again, less than human who will attack them in any number of ways attack their institutions, attack their sacred places of concentrated power, 
that that becomes an imperative to enact further measures of surveillance and control against us. Even and especially from the left, this is not a uniquely right-wing phenomenon. It's not. And the folks who like to insist to me, oh, well, there's people who are on the left, whether that's the left in name only Democratic Party, or the actual left, are somehow always have disabled people's best interest in mind, I say, I don't trust them unless they're a disabled leftist. And even then, I don't know, because if they're a disabled leftist, but they happen to be white, they might still be someone who is not someone that it's safe for me to be in community with or organizing around, because that is a person who, unless they've been doing some serious self-work and community work with their own network of people that they organize with, is probably somebody who will continue to perpetuate these notions of disabled folk as burdens and inhibitions in preventing the revolution from taking place, as people who will somehow pose a threat to the anti-violence, non-violent future that we're hoping to build, because I, I guess, you know, people with my type of brain were just a scary one. And so that's why, you know, for so many of us, the organizing that we do, whether it is attempting to do so within spheres of power, like within the halls of the academy, or within the pillars of law, as violent as it might be, or outside in the streets organizing with our friend, creating cultural work together, that we do it ourselves because we've learned that we can't wait for those who have the power and the privilege and the resources to do it for us. Because we've learned that if we are not vigilant at all times, the term disability justice will become co-opted by, for example, a law firm that represents people applying for social security disability benefits. Something that people need and are denied and that the policy around them is something that's seriously flawed and based upon all these ableist ideas, but these, these are not people that are, that are doing the work of radical disability justice. Disability justice is co-opted by a university website, you can look it up if you want, where they simply discuss ideas about including disabled people. Because, you know, including us fixes all of our problems. <laughs> you are welcome to attend our inclusive event. Oh, sorry, there, there's like a step, but it's totally like almost accessible, right? Here, here's your step. And you can join us for our wonderful community gathering. And we didn't label any of the food. And it probably has all your allergens. And you wanted to eat. And now you're having an anaphylactic shock reaction. Oh, maybe we should call an ambulance. Maybe. If we just rely on other people, they will take our own radical notions. And they will try to steal them away from us. Disability culture is something powerful and something that can be, for many of us, incredibly healing. And yet that idea, too, is often co-opted and appropriated by non-disabled people who want to talk about culture related to their idea of disability, which is inevitably infantilizing and reductive. But they'll call it disability culture anyway. Disability studies being applied to programs that are based in rehabilitation science programs or public health programs where there is little to no critical um, examining of disability at all where the medical model remains predominant but are still using this idea that we're going to call our program disability studies because that's now the trendy thing to do because that's something that people are paying attention to. So why don't we just say, well, we're disability studies. This is how we, we lose the effort that we've gained if we're not vigilant about it. If we allow ourselves and our work to become co-opted and appropriated, it's very easy for us to lose the frayed connections that we've begun to build in our own community groups, in our own attempts at peer education, in our own attempts to create artwork and writing that actually reflects not just our experiences and our shared historical and collective trauma, but also our shared and collective aspirations and our hopes and our dreams. The kind of societies and communities that we want to build and to inhabit and to share with one another. That's the kind of work that I've been invested in now 
And it's the kind of work that I, I know that many who are here in this room are also laboring at each day. And for those of you who are present here who are not committed to doing this work, I hope that this is an invitation to you as well as a kind of imperative that this work is necessary and it requires all of us and each one of our contributions in order to create lasting fabric of disability culture. Lasting fabrics of communities working in solidarity and sharing resources and building alternative economies to those that the state and our universities and corporations would like to prevent us from creating with one another. It's the kind of work that we often don't even think of as real work, let alone as activism, but it is, I assure you. When you brought the hot chocolate over to a friend that was struggling with something, that was work. That was something important to do. Is that going to erase whole legacies of state violence? No, of course not. I don't think anybody here would try to claim that. But it is something that is important to do. The conversation you have with someone just about something that's troubling you and something you hope for this year now that it's 2019 and we've made another rotation around this solar body at the center of our, of our system here, that's important. We don't talk to each other in some form or another. It could be face-to-face, -face, it could be online, it doesn't really matter. We don't talk to each other in some way or another. Then how are we to build community? We don't do it alone. This is not a solitary endeavor. The work of disability justice has always and always will call upon each of us to contribute, not just work in the sense of defining us by productivity, but to contribute merely our being and our existence to it. And work follows in whatever form, however precarious or inconsistent it might be, work follows. Now, I, I don't know most of you here, and I actually don't know where, well, I know, the rest of my actual slides are on um, a flash drive that's in another state, but I don't have them. And I found a couple of my slides, and then I found all these slides from another talk, which is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I found all these slides from not this talk, <laughs> which is great. What? Let's, let's just look at Miyamigas' quote, just that there. I like that quote. It's a quote that says, ableism is connected to all of our struggles because it undergirds notions of whose bodies are considered valuable, desirable, and disposable. And it's a quote from Mingus' essay, How Our Communities Can Move Beyond Access to Wholeness. That's what this slide shows. We just flipped through a lot of slides that are not from this talk, which is great. But I, I want to ask, I don't know most of you who are present in this room today, how many of you here are associated in some way with the University of Minnesota by a show of hands? And that's most of the room. And how many here are like, um, no, is that weird? And that's a few people. A few people. Now, how many folks here who are present consider yourselves to be or want to be an activist of some kind, by whatever definition, by a show of hands? And that's like, I don't know, three-fourths most of the room? Three-fourths most of the room? And of those, keep your hands up who have thought of yourselves as or want to be an activist, how many of you have felt that you have been given, explicitly or not, the message that whatever you are doing is not enough? And I see most of the same hands staying in the air, and a few like, oh, maybe. And how many of you, by show of hands, have felt that you were inadequate or insufficient as an activist because you, you didn't take a particular class that would have educated you on something? That's a number of people. That you didn't go to a particular protest or demonstration? That's a number of people. That you recently learned something about a marginalized community's history that you didn't know about at all before. That's a lot of people. Because your primary form of activism is something online, by a show of hands. Because that's a few people. Because no one in your family shares your commitment to social change, or very few. That's a number of people. Because you don't have or want to have a quote-unquote professional job doing activism, that that somehow makes you inadequate. <laughs> That's a number of people in a maybe. Because you're not majoring or doing your graduate studies in a field that is very embedded in social change movements. That's a number of people as well. Because you didn't go to a particular event or conference. Because this is the first event that you've been to this year. 
or at all from Critical Disability Studies Collective. That's a number of people as well, right? And so I want you to think about the fact that almost all of us have received and perhaps internalized this idea that whatever we're doing is somehow inadequate. See, this is work that cuts against the grain of what disability justice calls us to do. Because this is how we have internalized capitalist and ableist and racist hierarchies of labor. If you can do certain types of labor, if you can be in certain spheres, if you can produce a certain output of work that is visible and quantifiable, then you can count as a real activist. But the goalpost, friends, is always changing. The goalpost is always changing. And by these measures, none of us will ever be enough. Disability justice work calls us to reject this type of siloing of hierarchy that we've imposed on whatever work it is that we're doing that, that again, imbues misogynistic and patriarchal ideas of what even counts as labor worth compensating or acknowledging. Because if we want to dismantle legacies of state violence that says that disabled people are useless eaters and public charges, or hulking monsters waiting to be shot and killed and then removed from memory and mind. We have to start in our own communities to reject that very same notion that if we're not somehow pulling our weight, that we're not contributing enough, that we don't deserve to be here. And that who and what we are and what we have to offer is not valuable. These are false and dangerous notions. Because I'm here today on this allegedly warm day, <laughs> and in comparison, to remind us all that we deserve to be here, that we deserve to take up space, and that that's true no matter what we're studying or have as a job title or if we even have a job at all, that that's true no matter whether other people are going to tell us you've achieved something or you're still not enough. We still deserve to be here. Because that is, in itself, a radical revelation and a radical affirmation that we do not exist only to be defined by what society wants us to be. That we do not exist only to be defined based on how we can neatly force ourselves into the contours of an ableist capitalism. But we exist, and the work that each of us is doing every single day, even if you don't currently conceptualize of it as work, that is work to undermine those systems and legacies of violence so that our generation and the generations to come after us can begin to also reap the legacies that our ancestors have tried to pass down to us of our healing collectively as communities, of our dreaming, of our building, of our creating, of what we might engender if we free ourselves from this violent expectation and presumption and give ourselves permission to simply be. Thank you. I believe that we wanted to set aside a bit of time for some questions and answers. And I think we have about, what, 10 minutes or so in which to do that. So this microphone will be traveling the room. I'm trying to avoid microphone feedback. If you need to go, as people are doing, please feel free to run out. Don't die by tripping over the wire. We do like having you alive. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like to stick around, feel free to do that. And I'll be here for a little while. But if there are any questions or comments about this um, or anything else, feel free to log words in my general direction. I have a question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
I have a question about a question. What's a question that you still get asked a lot when you do talks or just in your general everyday life about disability justice and things that you're surprised you still get asked? Um, okay, so wait, until you got to the end of that, I was about to say, well, <laughs> do, you, do you mean questions that I like or questions that I'm pissed off You can at? do yeah, both. What are, that what are some I promising mean, questions? Yeah, what are some promising questions? What are some not-so-promising questions? Uh, promising questions are when people ask me things, well, well, I'm white, what can I do to challenge white supremacy? Mm -hmm. like, great, I'm glad you're asking. Also, there's a million resources out there, and I'm happy yes. to share it share them with you. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't possibly give you instructions in, like, the next five minutes. Like, but, you know, uh, resources exist. Similar questions, I'm not disabled. Um, and holy shit, I've been really ableist. How can I not be ableist anymore? Well, it doesn't happen by the snap of a finger. But there are a lot of resources, and I'm happy to share with you um, for further learning and unlearning. Um, other promising questions, do you have specific strategies um, that for advocating in a particular type of arena? And my answer to variations on that question are always, it depends on what arena you're in, what your relationships are with, are like with the people who are there, and what kind of a relationship you hope to still have or don't care about having anymore um, in what you're doing. And that would inform what tactics or strategies might make sense to use in that context. So there's not a blank answer to that. Sorry. Um, <laughs> not promising questions. Oh, let me see. <laughs> Some highlights of not promising questions. You seem to really hate white people. <laughs> <laughs> just reverse racism and actually the same kinds of problems that like, left, left, leftists like to talk about. My daughter has autism, and she says that she's a non-binary gender and wants me to call her a they. But I think it's because she's afraid of the harsh realities of facing misogyny of being a woman. Oh, so God. You say that? <laughs> Please have someone else you raise know, your daughter. You know, for the last two hours that you were giving this keynote, I just counted and you kept pacing three steps forward and three steps back. <laughs> Is that like a thing related to your autism? Oh, my God. Um... I could probably keep going with some highlights, but that gives you an idea. Yeah, that was helpful. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for your talk. Um, I'm curious about what you're working on right now. Like, you said you're a fellow, or um, Jenny said that. Uh, just, just curious what, like, what's exciting in your work right now. Uh, well, what's really exciting is that yesterday um, I was supposed to be at a client's IEP meeting with a horrible, abusive school that's doing a million kinds of fucked up things, and the school's attorney said, okay, 2 p.m., see you there, and I'm like, great, see you at 2, um, and as I was driving up to the school parking lot right about 2 p.m., I get an email, that's a very terse email from the school official that says the meeting was scheduled for one and already took place, <gasps> and I'm like, excuse me? What? <laughs> so that's what's exciting this week, aside from the cockroaches in our office. Are you recording this? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are cockroaches. Um, DC is notorious for them. Um, I have run out of the building screaming a few times, uh, perhaps more times than I like to admit. That's probably not the question you were asking. I would say at work, well, at work, you asked at work. Um, I'm also working on um, part of some comments about Maryland state discipline regulation that um, there's some, a, a lot of concerns about people that are involved with drafting these regulations, so I and a number of other people are trying to um, make them better and not shitty, mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll succeed, but we'll see. Um, and uh, also at work, you're working on developing um, a case related to institutionalization um, that doesn't look like conventional institutionalization, but I can't uh, really say a whole lot more about that, especially since we're being recorded. But outside of work, um, I am uh, working on several pieces of writing, which are in various stages of late, um, and I am uh, working on trying to draw up some more support for the Fund for Community Reparations for Autistic People of Color's Interdependence, Survival, and Empowerment also known as the Autistic People of Color Fund. Any autistic person of color anywhere around the world is eligible for funds. Um, we give out micro grants for almost anything imaginable. And by almost, I mean, if you want to buy a murder weapon from us, you intend to use it in a murder, uh, we can't give you one for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And because we did get sponsorship from a 501c3, if you want to use the money to campaign for or against a politician being elected or defeated in an election, you can't use the money for that. But anything <laughs> else, you can use the money for. Um, so the fund is available if you go to autismandrace.com. There's information about it if you or someone you know is eligible. But also if you or someone you know have access to money, which maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know anyone's class status in here. Um, please give us money or tell them <laughs> to give us money because we're about to run out of money and then we have like another several dozen people that are facing situations ranging from imminent eviction to power being turned off, yes in this cold, um, and uh, needing to pay fines to the courts so they don't get thrown back in jail, being able to feed their kids and themselves, being able to see their therapist, being able to get gender affirming surgery, etc. who won't be able to do those things because apparently no other source of funding is available to them. So if you or people you know have money, please give them to us. That is something I'm working on. It's exciting in the sense of, yes, we're taking care of each other, and it's also really like race on the edge of your seat because uh, we're running out of money. Mm -hmm. uh, we started with about $8,000. We just got in um, by siphoning money off of another project, like $1,200, and that's about to be gone in like two weeks. So um, those are things I'm working on. <laughs> also trying to figure out how to get my cat to stop climbing on the kitchen table. <laughs> I constructed a six foot tall cat tree. She's still climbing on the kitchen table. <laughs> um, so if anyone has any advice, let me know. I've spoken a lot, but if anyone else wants to ask a question. Uh, thanks for your talk, and also thank you for all the psychologists that were working out there. I follow you on Twitter, where you have sometimes mentioned about like being um, transracially and transnationally adopted, and I was wondering if you would be comfortable sharing some thoughts about how that has intersected with your um, disability or activism. Yeah, so the issue of transracial, transnational adoption, which um, some other transracial um, adoptees have talked about as transracial abduction in many cases is deeply intertwined with with white supremacist like notions that white able people need to save, rescue, or heal um, disabled, poor, black, brown, Asian, kids of color, both in the US and outside of it. Um, something that I've noticed is that many of us <coughs> who've been adopted, especially transnationally, but also transracially, are also disabled kids. Um, my sister, who's also adopted, was born with congenital conditions. Several of my close friends, who are also transnational and or transracial adoptees, were also disabled and often adopted at older ages because orphanages and state programs and for-profit programs will, will place value on kids. There's a really horrifying story that I read um, several years ago, and I don't remember the source of it, so and I haven't been able to find it since, which is really upsetting because I like to cite my sources, so I don't know where it came from. But someone had written about how <coughs> one time at their workplace, um, they saw pinned to a cork board in a shared area, um, a story that was supposed to be one of those inspiring, heartwarming stories. And But the story was about how a family, a white-abled couple, wanted to adopt a child out of an orphanage in um, a country that's predominantly not white, and I don't remember which country it was. But they wanted to adopt this child, and the orphanage promised them a healthy baby to adopt. So they went to the orphanage, they traveled overseas, and they were presented with a baby that very clearly had a disability. And the family said, this is not the healthy child we were promised. And so they made the orphanage take back that baby, and then the next day they were presented with another baby, baby number two, which also had a very clear and visible disability. And the parents were like, this is also not the healthy baby we were promised, and they sent that child back. And on the third try, the orphanage finally presented them with a baby who did not appear to have any known or obvious disabilities or conditions that could be medicalized in some way or another at all. And the family went home and said, finally, we have our healthy baby child. Mm -hmm. And this was our family success and happiness story. And I read that story, and I immediately wanted to set a lot of things on fire, mm -hmm. except that I'm afraid of flames, and probably my landlord would not give me back my security deposit <laughs> if I burned down my building. I, mean, I just get the sense they would say, no, you can't have that. <laughs> um, also, there could be criminal charges involved. But I wanted to set things on fire. I wanted to throw things out a window, and or find the people at this orphanage, and particularly these parents who wanted to adopt, and do some really horrible things. I don't mean that literally, for the sake of the recording. <laughs> I mean it's like metaphorically, in the sense that I'm having like vengeful thoughts and fantasies of, ugh, why? But it was the idea that you could treat children of color, 
from another country as commodities to be bargained for, to be exchanged as defective goods when one wasn't what you wanted, and to do so entirely on the basis of disability was horrifying and disgusting, but completely unsurprising. Because what I've tweeted, so I know you say you follow me on Twitter, when I've tweeted about issues of transracial, transnational adoption, there is a particular small group of trolls on Twitter who always reply to those tweets, and never to any of my other tweets, only to those tweets, <laughs> saying, well, what would you have wanted to happen to you instead? Like, as if this is a gotcha question. Like, well, what would you have wanted to happen? Like, so you're saying, like, um, <coughs> my, my parents, like many adoptive parents, like, regardless of all of the things they might have done that are good or positive, one of the awful things that many adoptive parents do, particularly white parents of transracially adopted children of color, is they will say to you variations of, we saved you, we rescued you. My parents told me that every day as a child. We saved your life, we rescued you, because if we left you in China, you'd be dead now. You have an amazing life in the United States because Jesus brought you to us. It was God's will. And that's what I was told every day of my life. This idea that if I'm here, it's because it was for my own good, that they should be praised by everyone in the world, they should be the subject of adulation, that I owe them my eternal gratitude with no conditions or qualifications on it. And that this is more so the case now that I've been identified as a disabled person. Well, what do you think it's like for the disabled in China? Like, why are you so angry all the time? You have it good here. What would it have been like if you stayed over there? And you know, the, the reality is, there's probably a lot of awful, fucked up things that would have happened in my life had I lived my life in China. There's also a lot of awful, fucked up things that happened to me living here in the United States. Uh, <laughs> fucked up things are not unique to countries of predominantly people of color, contrary to the white savior's civilizing mission. And so, when we talk about transracial and transnational adoption through a lens of disability justice, we're talking about still the valuation and devaluation of people's bodies. The commodification of human beings for profit and based upon the very same systems of valuing people based on productivity, based on bodily appearance, shape, size, color. And when we're talking about should it be possible to edit people's genes for desirable traits or not, the quote-unquote designer baby stare, you know, we're also talking about questions of what is and what are the profound ethical dangers of adoption now, whether that's adoption within national borders or transnationally, adoption within racial or ethnic groups, or transracially, uh, or adoption that is, you know, across all of these possible boundaries and borders. There are awful dangers to the way that abortion is, not abortion, adoption. Wow, that was a Freudian slip there. <laughs> <laughs> Insert your own joke that, you know, adoption is rhetoricized in the way that it's framed, uh, particularly in this overly romantic view that favors the white savior mentality of, you know, white saviors need to rescue these kids because who else is gonna care for them? The implication also being that the communities of origin cannot and will not care for children, notwithstanding that many of us um, have been or come from families and communities that are generationally low or low income that are generationally affected and targeted by wars, by genocide, and are still raising children. I'm not, you know, saying that any parentage or community is inevitably perfect or free of abuse. Abuse happens in every possible context and community and is often colored by the particular cultural norms and other axes of power that may influence the relationship <coughs> between the person doing the abusing and the targeted person. But this idea that adoption is somehow the tool for wealthy white people to rescue poor kids of color from abroad um, really erases our own communities and ancestral knowledge. And at least for me as a person, that's something that I'm mourning all the time. That I don't have any strong cultural connection to my own communities and heritage. And I will never be white. I will never be allowed to be white. But I will never be allowed to fully be with Chinese American community either, because that was stolen from me. So, there is one more hand. Oh, oh sorry. Um, oh, microphone. 
Sorry, just on that note, um, what are your thoughts on like um, disability justice um, internationally? Um, like, uh, what I've noticed, uh, like, I mean, I haven't traveled abroad or anything, but like, people who have traveled to like, say, even like China, like Beijing, or like Korea, or whatever, say that like, the people who are, um, you know, who are living on the streets are people with disabilities, or, you know, most children who are abandoned are children with disabilities. So, I have lived a little bit outside the country, but not a lot. Um, and I've visited a number of countries to meet with other disability justice organizers. And while I certainly have to acknowledge that my experience and my work is U.S. centric, and only because that's where I've lived most of my life, and it's where I live now. And I certainly don't think it's my place to tell other people outside of my own communities what they should or shouldn't be doing or prioritizing. Um, I will say that when, when folks, disabled or not, have raised that question of like, well, what about in, in your say in Beijing, poor people on the streets are all people with disabilities. Children who are abandoned are all children with disabilities. You know, that's also true here. Um, depending on which survey you're looking at, somewhere I think between 62 and 68% of people who are homeless have a developmental disability. Mm -hmm. And that's not something we think about that much. Um, I don't know the numbers, but a huge number of children who are in or have been in the foster system in the United States are disabled, either from birth or acquire disabilities because of trauma and abuse um, that's very rampant in that. And so in that respect, I don't think that, uh, at least in those particular issues that you've raised, that our struggles um, are so vastly different, if that makes sense. The cultural context and the political context and conditions under which people are organizing from nation to nation are certainly very different. But that on the ground reality of who's living in the streets or who's been abandoned to the state welfare system, um, that's not unique to XYZ other country or somehow something that doesn't happen in the United States, but it does. And so I guess, you know, when I've talked to people who are organizing uh, in any number of ways, policy-wise, community organizing, or academically outside the U.S., we often marvel at the many similarities between issues that we're working on, but um, the tactics or strategies that we're using relevant to the political or social conditions under which we're organizing is where we differ and where we have, I think, opportunities to learn from each other. And I've been trying to do quite a bit of that, and I don't know how successful I've been, but I hope to. Um, continue incorporating what I learned from people organizing outside my neighborhood and community into what I'm doing. Thank you so much everyone for coming. Uh,